So the title of my presentation um, is uh, Primary Care for Non-Communicable Diseases in the Philippines. So my co-author uh, for this paper um, is or Jana Uy and Mr. Lal Casa, so both researcher at PIDS. So the objective of the paper is to basically understand the readiness of primary care system uh, in the provide in the provision of non-communicable uh, disease services. So basically, the flow of my presentation will be uh, the status of the, the first one will be the status of non-communicable diseases in the Philippines. So where are we now? The second part will be about primary care. So uh, we need to I need to provide some concepts of primary care and how do we understand it. And the third part will be finding the nexus or the relationship of primary care and non-communicable diseases. And the last one will be an assessment of the readiness of primary care system uh, uh, in terms of financing, service delivery, human resources, um, uh, and governance. So you can actually find the full paper in our PIDS website. So uh, next slide, please. So uh, before I go on, I just want to um, define what non-communicable diseases are. Right? So as Ma'am Sel mentioned a while ago, so NCDs are chronic conditions, right? These are long long duration conditions that result to do as a, it is a, it's a it's a result of different combination of genetics physiological environmental and behavioral factors right so the examples of cardiovascular uh, the examples of non-communicable diseases are cardiovascular diseases such as you know, heart attacks strokes right uh different types of cancers um, chronic respiratory diseases such as copd asthma and diabetes so these are some of the Okay, so NCDs are now the leading causes of morbidity and mortality in, in, the, in the country, right? Here you can see uh, DALIS is a globally accepted measure of morbidity and mortality. We call it the disability adjusted life years. You can see here that the share of non-communicable diseases are increasing rapidly in the last 10 years. So currently around 65% of the total DALIS are accounted for non-communicable diseases. So if you look at uh, mortality or death, that NCD accounts for about 68%. So we expect that the share of non-communicable diseases will continue to increase in the medium to long term. So in, in our paper, uh, Jan and I made some projections on, on, on the, the, the trajectory of non-communicable diseases. And our estimate that our estimate is that the number of NCD cases will double in the next 20 years. So if you look at the epidemiologic uh, distribution or pattern, non-communicable diseases um, and infectious diseases are still the major causes of disease burden in the country. So when I say infectious diseases, these are your tuberculosis, um, respiratory tract infection. So they remain a major cause of burden. So, but over time you would see that they are decreasing similar to a lot of developing countries, right? But for NCD, the burden is actually increasing rapidly. So you would see ischemic heart disease, um, stroke, diabetes, chronic kidney disease, and COP, they're actually increasing very rapidly. So, so what is the implication of this uh, uh, increasing NCD? So as Mam uh, Sel mentioned a while ago, NCDs in general are very expensive because of the chronic nature of the disease. So once you have it, once you have a diabetes, for example, you have that lifetime, right? Um, um, and a bunch of studies already have examined not only the, the implications of NCD, having an NCD on health spending, on, on poverty, etc., but also the, the larger impact or the broader impact of NCDs on economic productivity, etc. So, so and, and in addition to that, treatment of NCDs are actually very hard. It's very resource intensive for providers, etc. You need to change the way how we deliver services. It's more intensive. You need more. You need more MRI, etc. So it's, it's it's a very resource intensive um, um, health system. Right. Next slide, please. So NCDs are now afflicting the poor. So while at the global level there is this perception that NCDs are now afflicting the poor, evidence remains to be very limited, right? So what we did, John and I cleaned and analyzed the mortality data, like millions of data points from the uh, PSA, 
and we merge it with the poverty incidence of municipalities, right, in the Philippines. So while the share, look at if you look at the, the, the graph, while the share of non-communicable diseases remains to be higher among the rich, which is expected, right? The share of NCD is actually increasing rapidly among the fifth class uh, municipalities in the Philippines. And if you look at um, the richest LGU, it's already plateauing, which is actually a very uh, consistent picture in developing developed country um, um, epidemiological uh, picture, right? Next slide, please. So if you look at the premature NCD debt, so um, it's quite high in poorest local government. So the share uh, among the richest LGU, I mean, the share of premature death of NCD in, in NCD is relatively lower among, in, in the richest uh, local governments. Right? So when I say premature death, these are um, deaths occurring before the life expectancy. So you can see that you can see a very nice gradient here. Um, the share of premature death. Uh, increases as poverty incidence increases. So this reflects the, the poor uh, prognosis, right, of non-communicable diseases, and this can be driven a lot of factors, perhaps access to healthcare services, et cetera. So the increasing burden of non-communicable diseases is driven primarily by the increasing risk factors, for example, hypertension, right, uh, high blood sugar, um, uh, obesity, or high BMI, high blood uh, cholesterol and smoking. So you could see the red, uh, uh, the red figures. So these are the share of uh, total DALIs attributed to these risk factors. So, so, so that's basically uh, the status of non-communicable diseases in the Philippines. So, so before I connect the two, I want to describe a bit what primary care is because uh, we need to make sure that we are at the same, uh, we have the same understanding what primary care is. So if you look at, there's a lot of definition of primary care, but the most uh, uh, um, uh, common definition of primary care is a level of healthcare system that provides entry to the system for all new for all new needs and problems, provides person focus, um, not not totally disease oriented uh, care over time, and provides for all but very uncommon unusual condition and coordinates or integrates care provided elsewhere by others. So this definition, if you try to, 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 to understand this further, there are four important concepts in this definition. Number one is accessibility, right? Meaning that the health facility should be near to the people. It should be near to the community, right? It should be within his or community. The second is comprehensiveness, meaning that essential health services that the population needs are addressed. So these are the first contact services. So for example, if I if I have a family planning need, right? If I need a condom, et cetera, I will go to that facility, right? Um, um, if I have cough, I will go there uh, immediately and not to the hospital. In short, if I have any concern, I, I, I have I have um, I have a facility to to actually visit. So imagine the relationship of the patient and provider is very critical here. So imagine you have a family doctor, right? Um, but then another important concept of primary care is continuity, means um, that the patient has a constant, constant, I wanna emphasize the word constant relationship with the provider who take care of you all throughout, right? So, uh, and not just only a particular period in time. Um, and last one is coordination. The primary care facility will help you navigate the, uh, navigate uh, uh, in the in the in the health system, so it will actually help you find hospitals, for example, if you need one, right? So there is actually a good referral system. So so I just want to give an example to this. So so this so this was this is what happened during COVID, right? Most Filipinos do not have any relationship with the health system, and primary care system is actually your umbilical cord to the health system. So for example, if you have cough because if you feel that you have COVID, you don't know what where to go, right? Because you do not have that, that, umb that umbilical cord or that connection to the health system. So yeah, because we do not have, you know, most of us do not have that relationship with the health system, right? That's why primary care is very, very important. So next slide. So this is basically uh, some of the important concepts of, uh, of I mean, the, the important concepts of primary care. So access, I uh, mentioned a while ago, comprehensiveness, when I say comprehensive, that all types of services should be there, basic essential services, 
Second, third is continuity. So you have the person have an important relationship with the health system, like you have a family doctor or you have a family nurse that if you need anything, you will go there. And the last one is coordination. So there is gatekeeping, uh, there is collaboration with, with hospitals, etc. So it is highly integrated to the health system. So next slide. So, so basically, this is what uh, a typical pathway of a well-functioning primary care. So even if you, you are not sick, if you, have, if you are not, if you don't have symptoms, you still have relationship to the primary care facility, right? So you have connection already, right? So that's why you will see the, 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 the person below that, like, she has connection in the primary care facility, even if she's not sick, right? So, so if, if the person got sick, the, the primary care facility will refer that person to a level one hospital. And if the, if the level one hospital cannot, if the patient needs more higher level of care, that person will be referred to an end referral hospital, right? So that's how a typical primary care uh, system works in many developed and highly functional health systems, right? So, so why, why primary care is the optimal channel for healthcare system um, response to NCD? So in, as I've said, in addition to the fact that there is actually overwhelming empirical evidence that suggests that primary care leads to better health outcomes, better quality care and efficiency, it is important to uh, understand two important concepts. So I think it's important to examine the nature of two diseases, infectious diseases and non-communicable diseases. So um, remember that the goal of any infectious diseases, let's say, for example, pneumonia or uh, diarrhea, the goal is actually to remove the infectious agent, which is, let's say, bacteria or virus. So, so and that's it, right? So once you remove the bacteria, you'll, you'll be fine. So, so that's why episodic delivery of care is actually justifiable. So you just go to a facility, you don't have any relationship with the facility, and that's it, right? You just get antibiotics and you're done. But remember that the goal of NCD is different. The difference is not to eliminate infectious diseases, but the common goal of NCD is actually to reduce the symptom. You reduce the pain, you improve the quality of life. So because, you know, you cannot, you cannot eliminate diabetes, right? So episodic delivery or one-time relationship of your health, of your physician or your provider is not really optimal and it will not work. So what works is that the NCD, you have a continuous care or relationship throughout your lifespan. So you need to have a very, very strong relationship with the provider. So that's why NCD is actually a very important driver. I mean, import, a primary care is an important tool in addressing non-communicable diseases. What we are is our health system is very episodic, right? It's not from, it's, it's everyone is working, health facilities are working in silos, right? But it will not work if most of your common diseases are non-communicable diseases because you need interactions and interlinkages with facilities. So next slide. These are the, dip, so most of the critical interventions in NCDs could be, you know, um, um, could be done in a primary care facility and NCD prevention and control an intervention can be classified into two, like primordial intervention. I mean, next slide, please. So primordial intervention, yes. uh, primary uh, prevention, secondary prevention, and tertiary prevention. When I say primordial, is that before you have the risk factor, right, um, you have already connection. So this, the, the function of your primary care is to promote physical activity, population-based anti-smoking campaign, promotion of healthy diet. When you say primary prevention, is that you prevent the risk factors, like the primary care facility should be able to provide smoking cessation intervention because you already have the risk factor, uh, like smoking, you have already the risk factor of high BMI, so the primary care should be able to give you advice on weight control, etc. The secondary prevention is actually um, more on screening, so the primary care facility should be able to do pap smear, um, risk screening for cardiovascular or clinical breast exam for possible breast cancer, etc. And when I say tertiary prevention, these are when you have already the disease, it, it should be able to provide services that control the disease, right? Like, for example, uh, glucose control, so um, BP control, uh, um, maintenance, provision of maintenance drug, etc. So all these prevention services should be able to be provided in, in, in a primary care uh, setting, right? Set. Next slide. So, so another is we expect that non-communicable diseases will be the dominant cause of disease burden, as I've mentioned a while ago. So hence, the, the most efficient way to address is through primary care. So John and I did some like Markov model 
to project the number of primary care visits related to NCD uh, in, in a midst of the growing number of NCD. So you can see the majority of primary care visits in the next 20 years will be primarily driven by non-communicable diseases. And if you look, infectious diseases and injuries will, will continue to plateau. So um, hence, the, we need to prepare the system. So we need to make sure that our primary care system is re ready to face the changing epidemiologic pattern. I think the question now is how do we achieve primary care oriented health system? So how do we strengthen it? So I mentioned a while ago that there are four features or processes essential in primary care. These are your access comprehensiveness, uh, continuity and coordination. However, for this to happen, it needs to have a proper bedrock that needs to be in place, right? That is your financing system should allow that, your governance system should allow that to, to have com accessible, comprehensive, continuity and coordinated care. Um, your HR should be able to do that. So we're going to assess uh, these different um, uh, domains, or I will call it like uh, building blocks, and if you look at the WHO or bedrock of primary care services. So, um, yeah, uh, next slide, please. So, before that, I want to mention the service delivery points of NCD. So, I've mentioned there are two, uh, um, uh, um, uh, two uh, service delivery points. Number one is your Barangay Health Station. Uh, the, the, the function of BHS should have the ability to provide primordial services, primary and secondary services, but sometimes it's very limited. The second is rural health units or your rural health units, right? Your RH or city health units. So that is the owner of that is your municipality. Um, and the catchment is usually um, municipality, right? So, so the, the NCD function of your primary care, I mean your RHU is primordial, right? similar to BHS. Uh, the, the RH should be able to provide primary care prevention, screening and diagnosis, etc. Uh, so it can provide primary, secondary, and tertiary. So let's start with governance, right? Let's start with the governance structure. The figure is basically um, showing you the devolved setup of the healthcare system. So basically the municipalities are expected to deliver and finance your health interventions, including your non-communicable diseases. So the primary care facility meaning the BHS and your RHU, are owned and operated by their local government units or your municipality. But the owner of the hospitals are mostly the provinces or you know mostly the provinces. So health facilities are operating in silos because they are viewed as an individual facility, not as a network of facilities. So there is no formal linkage between RHU and a level one facility in the Philippines. And again, this violates the most important tenet of primary care, which is there is a continuity of care. So in the past, we have tried to do like interlocal health zones, et cetera. But these arrangements are very, very informal. And to be honest, they are quite loose. So, so if you look at maybe if there is a, a, an assessment of interlocal health zone, they didn't, they didn't actually succeed because the, 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 the relationship of facilities are very um, informal. So, so, in, so this is the public system. And there is also a parallel private system. Again, there is no interlinkage between public and private facilities. Even between private facilities, they, they seldom exist. A private primary care facility and a private hospital, they are not talking to each other. There's no way that they are actually talking to each other. So that's how the fragmented system is, which is very common in many developing countries. But in many advanced societies, they were able to integrate those types of different health facilities regardless of level. Yeah. So next slide. So this is actually the patient journey, right? The lack of integration among health facilities. So, so if you are, if you, so this is a typical one, I would say. So if you are not sick, you will not go to a facility, right? So if you are sick, you can go anywhere. You can go to a primary care facility. You can go to hospital one, level one. You can go to hospital level two. You can actually go to a pharmacy, right? But that's how the how the, our the patient journey is. So. So when you look at, for example, PhilHealth, there are diseases like asthma, for example, that can be actually treated in primary care facility, but it's actually one of the top claims in hospitals, right? So, so, so there is actually inefficiencies already that you see. So um, this, is, this is actually violating most of the important primary care concepts um, um, uh, um, at the global level, right? So next slide, please. So we tried to look at um, the bypassing of um, uh, the bypassing of primary care facilities. So currently, unlike other countries where they can actually monitor referral system, in the Philippines, you do not have 
the capacity to monitor given the fragmented system. So, for example, in many countries, I'm not sure, like Thailand, for example, um, they, they should they should be able to track the patients, right? Where are they going from referral, I mean, from primary care and refer to the facility, etc. We are able to monitor that. So we try to use NBHS to examine those people with NCDs, right? And and just to have an idea on the level of bypassing that is happening. And you can see that a lot of rich people are going to hospitals for consultation. So you can see highly, highly segmented market, uh, and you want to see patients to go to primary care facilities, but instead they are going to hospital. And actually, that is also a reflection in, 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 in COVID, right? Like we do not we don't have a relationship with the primary care facility, so our tendency is actually go to a hospital. Right? So a lot of efficiency is also happening uh, because of you know practice of bypassing, uh, I mentioned a while ago. So next slide. So let's discuss the availability of primary care facilities, rural health unit, because remember, the most important tenet of primary care is accessibility. So it should be close to people. According to DOH, the travel time of RH should be 30 minutes so together with DOH. We, we analyze um, uh, using GIS to examine how many people have access to RHU within 30 minutes. And you would be amazed that only 50% of the population have access to RHU within 30 minutes. Currently, we do not know the stock of privately owned primary care facility. The, the DOH do not monitor this at all, but there is now move to track them. So we don't know what's happening in the private sector. Next slide. Um, same. Same also with BHS or Barangay Health Station. Only half of barangays have BHS. If you, if you look at the local government code, each barangay should have BHS, but only 40% that's our estimate have BHS. Next slide. Uh, so while the availability of uh, and accessibility of primary care, but the capacity of primary care is also essential. So we try to do some very uh, random survey so we, uh, under these studies, we conducted a survey of 20 RHUs, and the capacity is highly variable. For instance, of the 10 RHUs we surveyed, only facilities have the complete tools and equipment to screen NCDs. We really need to check not only the availability of health facility, but the capacity to provide very, very basic health services. Let's, next slide. So let's go to financing. So you can see here that NCD accounts for a big chunk of our total health spending in the country. And this is expected to continue in the medium term, right, given the trajectory of uh, epidemiological diseases. Uh, so if we, um, so you can see here that NCD, which is the gray one, now accounts for a very big chunk of, of, of total health spending. So we analyze this one using the national health accounts. Next slide. So, so if we actually analyze spending, health spending by provider, around 4% only accounts for primary care in the Philippines. If we, for example, share share the spending of other countries, for example, sorry, I keep mentioning Thailand. So we actually uh, collaborated with Thai researcher on this one. They're actually spending around 10% of their health spending for primary care. So we are actually spending around $6 per person. That's already for both public and private. But my assumption here is that it's actually mostly private. So you would expect like $2 per person from the public system. So and most of these are very, as I've said, it's private. Right? Next slide. So um, please note that the delivery of health services, now we're going to uh, still financing. Please note that delivery of health services is the main role of local governments, right? but the capacity of local government to finance health services is highly variable. Right? So here we can see that large variation in health spending that you would expect Makati will be in the top, like Sulu will be in the, in the bottom. Right? So local health spending is a challenge so this one underlies you have issues in the in, in uh, uh, local budgets for health, like so you have problem with HR, medicine, technology, etc. So so the decision, the lack of budget, is actually uh, a decision or the priority of local government executives. Like oftentimes the LGU cannot afford to a lot more because it yeah you know, it must fund other programs. We know this already. So it's a very prominent issue, especially in poorer local government based on our key informants and uh, surveys. Right? So slide, next slide, please. So, so with the limited public spending of local governments, others are actually trying to get others financing sources. Number one is DOH subsidies like HFAP, human resources, etc. So, you know, sometimes field health also reimburses primary care benefit, but it's very limited. 
Um, um, and yeah, so it's the, the system, the, the financing system is very fragmented in a way that it, it dilutes the purchasing power of, of, of your purchaser, right? So, um, um, so th that's a very, very big problem. So next slide. So with the public spending, right? Um, the problem is that um, the DOH remains to be an important financing, right? Uh, source of financing. Remember, because the local government do not have enough capacity, the national government actually provide grants to local government to actually provide technical assistance um, to, look, uh, to municipalities to build rural health units, barangay health station. We've analyzed actually HFAP and um, you would see an equitable distribution. So the technical assistance of the national government to augment primary care facilities at our RHS is highly inequitable. So we've analyzed it and we've seen that the allocation is based on poverty, but it's actually based on actually requests. So you would see that a lot of H spending for RHS are going to the rich municipalities and not the poor municipalities. So this is actually a very, very alarming and, and very striking way of how we provide technical assistance to local government. There's no framework at all. So the low public spending um, insurance when I say public spending, this is your health insurance, local government spending, and national spending. Hence, you would expect that most spending in NCD services at the primary care level is mostly out of pocket. So you would see the blue line. Um, it's almost all out of pocket, very small, fill health. Um, it, it's dominated basically by um, out of pocket salary, out of pocket loan, out of pocket donation. So, so it, you know, it's private out of pocket. Next slide. So let's go to HR. So um, um, only 10% of our issues in the country do not have doctors. So if you look at current guidelines, local government should have, I mean, our issues should have doctors and nurses, right? Um, so, but you would see lots of our issues do not have that, do not have uh, doctors. Next slide. Um, another important, uh, important is the limited capacity of health workers to conduct NCD programs. Very programmatic and disease focused. So lack of staff uh, relative to health programs and lack of training opportunities for NC NCDs, right? So these are the common themes that keep occurring if you do um, if you go if you go down at the at the grassroots level. So health workers are implementing NCD programs at least 10 with other 10 DOH programs. So imagine if you are RH1 one. If you're a, a, a municipal health officer, you need to in, you need to provide at least ten programs: NCD program, family planning program, immunization, etc. So you expect that to be delivered by a one physician, and in addition, that there is administrative uh, administrative functions. Right. Next slide. So again, another important is the limited capacity to provide health workers. Uh, I mean, limited capacity to provide uh, or conduct um, 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 NCD services. Like, for example, um, um, uh, one of the KIs is um, the inability for for um, uh, um, nurses and doctors to um, to provide um, um, visual inspection of cervical uh, uh, screening, right? Because they only train the doctor, but the doctor is so busy. So the nurses or the, the, the midwife cannot do it because they did not attend the training, something like that. So there are a lot of issues on how uh, the trainings are cascaded. Next slide. So here, I mean, this is also common so stack out. So we've also analyzed the stack out of NCD drugs in BHS and RHU. You would see a, a, a lot of them experience stack outs of most common NCD drugs. So I will not go through that. Um, um, next slide. Um, so health information is also a problem because there is no integration in health facilities. You would expect that you know you will not be able to understand what's happening or the interconnection of health facilities, right? So another is monitoring of evaluation for NCD services are weak. So LGUs primarily rely on counts and cases on death. They do not have patient management targets or indicators actually measure the effectiveness of NCDs for in, in information. So it's also difficult to collect data for indicators that require blood chemistry, et cetera, um, to actually measure um, uh, secondary inputs. So I will not go through the details. Uh, next slide. I think I don't have time. Uh, 
So here are some of the, uh, sum these are the summary issues under each domain, fragmented lack of integration among health facilities. So that's for handle health information. I mean, sorry, this is for health service delivery. So lack of gatekeeping, overlapping functions of national and local governments, under financing limited spending for primary care, multiple sources of financing that weakens purchasing power, out of pocket remains to be a major source, field health spending is negligible in terms of primary care, inequalities and in grants from national and local governments. For, for human resources, this is a scarcity of human resources, limited capacity to implement NCD services, and very disease oriented programmatic vertical type of delivery of uh, health services. Next slide. Um, so here under, um, sorry, this for, for, for health information, I, uh, I should I should put this under health information is scarcity of primary care facility. Um, and the second is the large, uh, the, uh, the, the, the lack of data on sick, uh, the lack of data for primary care providers. Um, for drugs, um, uh, um, um, stock out is very common. So next slide. So these are some of our recommendations. Um, um, so we are only providing two important recommendations um, under this one. So we call it short term and medium term. And the goal really is to improve efficiency and coverage. Number one is we know this already that we need to advance primary care benefit package. And that includes the provision of telemedicine. And under the, the primary care benefit package, allow the private sector to provide healthcare service under primary care uh, benefits, right? So there are innovative models like LGUs can actually contract out private providers to deliver a gamut of health services like those things. Second is explore the use of blended provider payments to, to drive optimal behavior. For example, the use of capitation for outpatient visits. But for example, um, and the use of fee-for-service for a screening, like acetic acid screening, right? So they do this in many advanced societies or advanced health system because you want, if you do fee-for-service, fee you want to get more acetic acid tests and screening tests, right? So the, the financing mechanism or the provider payment should be different, not only because we have the tendency to say, oh, let's just do capitation. But it depends on the health system goal, right? Another is reduce the fragmentation and I call it the schizophrenia in the financing sources, you know, delineate the role of QH in field health in purchase, improve purchasing power. So I think the DH is slowly transitioning its commodities. So we need to, to think about on how to do this. Next slide. Um, so for health service delivery, again, is to the goal is to improve efficiency. The first one is to actually advance the implementation of the UHC Act. Right? So integrate the facilities through the creation of the HPCN. So if we will able to integrate the, the, the core problem of integration in health information and health financing, we'll be able to address that, right? So you can do that with the national government should provide financial and non-financial in, incentives for provinces to integrate. Right now, there is no actual incentives for provinces to integrate their health services. I mean, integrate all the municipalities because there is you know, a political barrier there. And the only way to do that is to provide incentives, right? Um, you can also see some countries like the UK system, et cetera, finding mechanisms, how to integrate different facilities at the, provide, uh, at, the, at the provincial level. Another is comprehensive and smart technical assistance to local government. I think this is referring to the national government or the DH should actually provide local governments, a technical assistance to local governments who are actually in dire need, not, not those local governments who can actually, you know, um, who can actually afford it, right? So, and, and that goes through HFAP, HR, et cetera. Um, um, second is integrated care planning within the DPC, DPC, DPCB, right? So, so the way we plan now is that, um, okay, there will be program for immunization, there will be program for, for NCD, there will be program for, I don't know. So the, the goal there is actually to integrate them and look at them holistically, right? And when we provide services to local government, it's not very sporadic. It's not, okay, let's just give HR. They give like commodities. Like the way you do things is that you understand like the whole gamut of problem. Like in Ilocos Norte, for example, they lack HR, they lack HF, they lack commodities. Then you give them at the same time, not like, the facility, I mean, the, the program office are not talking to each other. So when you give them, 
they might have commodity, but they don't have HR, which is a very, very common problem, or they have HR, but they don't have commodity. So it's actually time to actually integrate it, right? So um, I think that's my last slide. So thank you.